pleasure to be here. It's uh, very nice to be talking at DEF CON uh, four years after uh, just this event. Make me uh, quit my job that I had so far and dive into this crazy world of blockchain. So, um, let's say continue. <coughs> Like the All right, so I would like to start off with uh, what back then was actually the vision of Ethereum, right? And the vision of Ethereum was actually not just a DeFi magic token machine, but it was going towards <coughs> the Web3, right? And in fact, Ethereum comprised many parts, and a blockchain was just one of them. There was supposed to be decentralized storage, messaging, like Swarm and Whisper, and then I guess somehow crypto winter happens, a lot of things shifted around, and we're happy that we still have the Ethereum blockchain around. Um, but to me, this, this whole vision of this Web3 vision of building decentralized and privacy-preserving applications is still something that I find very appealing to, to going beyond just financial applications. Because me personally, I mean, my, my e-banking is not the most exciting application I have. And in the meantime, a bunch of things happened, and a bunch of things um, have also quite some focus on privacy. Like we heard already in the panel right now that uh, we have mixers, right? So transaction and value can be handled relatively well um, in a decentralized <coughs> fashion. We've seen a lot of applications there. We also see uh, quite some movement on the storage front, right? So obviously, the IPFS Filecoin guys, but also StoreJ, which I heard runs IPFS, fine and a bunch of others. We also see a lot of computation-focused projects, which in turn, again, uh, many of which have quite an emphasis on, on um, privacy. But what I would like to talk about more is that for many of these applications, we really need a fundamental privacy foundation to enable communication between users and dApps and between different components of these dApps. Right? So this is, what we are, this is what we're aiming to build with Hopper. And uh, I would like to go a little bit into the why. Like, why would we do that um, from an yeah from an Ethereum perspective? So uh, one thing, and I don't know if the um, if the Tornado guys are still around, but this is from the Tornado website, right? So if you try to use, who here used Tornado actually? Anybody use mixers? Okay, so you just leaked some metadata, by the way. Um, so. Yeah, this is what you find on the website. Make sure to use different IP addresses for deposit and withdrawals. We can run using Tor browser or VPN, right? And that sounds fine, um, but actually neither Tor nor VPN are suitable in my mind to this DeFi level privacy which we're striving for here. So Tor is not decentralized at all. It's relatively easy to de-anonymize, and there's like a, a body of research on that whole topic. And VPNs are primarily um, corporate entities that are, you know, gathering some data and making it available for whoever needs it and or for whoever pays for it, right? So this is the business model of VPNs. Now, more specifically, broadcasting is not privacy preserving. And I would like to highlight this here because I see a lot of conflation between kind of broadcast-based schemes and mesh networks. I think especially in the Bitcoin ecosystem, you hear that every now and then, yeah, that we have this mesh network. This mesh network, and that's why it's private, right? No, a mesh network does not bring privacy, and the same goes for any other broadcasting-based scheme. So, I would like to briefly go through an example. So, um, we come up with a hypothetical network, so topology is uh, having some nodes, and initially nodes don't know a particular transaction. And once they do know a transaction, we mark it as X, and in between we draw some lines that show the edges, the connections of these nodes. And what's important is that this is totally public information, right? Anybody can query a node. Anybody can, can find out who has what transaction at what time. Um, so our hypothetical uh, network topology looks like this. Right? And what we see is that as a transaction kind of ripples through the network and gradually reaches uh, all of the nodes in the network, you can, of course, what, what you were just seeing, you were a passive observer of the network. Right? And you, as a passive observer of the network, were just finding out where this transaction originated from. And this is something that not just you can do, this is basically something that anybody out there can do which is pretty bad for a yeah, decentralized system that wants to bring us privacy and has all sorts of nice features on chain. 
And that again is the reason why the tornado guys made this suggestion, right, to use VPN or Tor. Um, and finally, one, one example that, that I find particularly striking is today I think we still live in this frontier world, right? So to me, this is we're really mostly at the Ethereum 0.1 stage, right? So what we see is that when you and your dev are in Osaka, you have MetaMask that connects to, well, default Infura, right? Let's face it, that connects then to the so-called decentralized Ethereum. And what we increasingly see, and I'm happy that we have projects like Dapnode, Avado, and some others, uh, that you have your node in your living room that you can connect to, right? So this is, this is what we can do. And still, like your hotel Wi-Fi provider, their ISP, and everybody in between can pretty decently find out that you're accessing your service and that you probably just broadcasted a transaction on Tornado. So what I would like to see is like a, a less, less, um, yeah, less revealing link between you and your DAP and actually the nodes that, um, that you interface. So this is what we want to do with Hopper to connect you and your wallet um, to a metadata private Ethereum network. Now, Hopper is decentralized incentivized privacy preserving messaging protocol. So we don't build a chat application, people can build on top of, on top of that. Um, Hopper is also a mixnet, so now we're going to just work briefly in how we achieve this privacy. So a mixnet basically means that nodes are sending messages. These messages are received by a relayer, which is short-term caching them, and we keep this updatable so that it can cater to different types of applications is then mixing the ordering of the transaction before they're relaying them in a different order. And what is important is that an incoming transaction and an outgoing transaction cannot be linked, right? They look different. And there are some packet formats that are optimized for exactly that, so that your um, traffic cannot be linked between incoming and outgoing um, transactions. Now, we use onion encryption, so basically we don't just do that once, but you do that in multiple times. So um, basically if you pass that message through a chain of three layers um, that each take one onion layer of an encryption of it, you have um, yeah, linkability that is hard to establish beyond guessing. Why would they do that? Well, and this is, this is an important point to me and one that makes the whole design of this network a lot harder is because they earn money for it. Who here is running a Tor node? One, two, two and a half. Two and a half. So we have two and a half. Out of this two and a half, how many exit nodes do we have in the room? Ah, okay. Why not? Why not? Well, of course. I'm in Switzerland. Ah, okay. Yes. So, I mean, the question is why would you, right? You have something that comes at quite non-zero cost, especially quite non-zero legal cost. So why would you do it, right? So any, any system that runs at scale needs incentives. And I think we've seen uh, how this, well, just kind of works, but still not very, works really well for Ethereum or any sort of blockchain systems where nodes don't have incentives to, to run a full node, right? So this is why we want to incentivize relayers. So basically, a hopper comprises a message and a payment layer. And on the message layer, um, we use, as described, on the encryption and the Sphinx format, which I will go into in a second a bit more in detail. And of course, we built this on libp2p, um, have a JavaScript implementation that I'll show later. And we have payment channels uh, that we will also discuss a little bit later in detail uh, with a POC on RinkB right now. So, Briefly, on the message layer, uh, what's going on? So Alice is sending a message to Dave via two hypothetical relayers, their friends Bob and Charlie. So Alice is formatting a message which has a header which comprises two components. One is routing information and the second one is payment information. Right? And then of course there's the body which contains the, the only encrypted message. So what she does is she basically, um, she defines the root, so it's source rooted. Um, she then assembles the header and sends it to Bob. Now what Bob can see in that header is so far only um, that Charlie is the next downstream downstream node. But what Bob does not, is not able to do, he's not able to extract the payment just yet because that would allow us to, to be susceptible to kind of take the money and run attacks, right? So I could just take all the money out and not do anything. 
So Bob actually needs the collaboration of Charlie. So once Charlie uh, helps Bob, um, he will receive uh, a key half with which he can unblind the payment channel. And of course it could be that uh, Charlie is just not very nice to Bob and simply doesn't do that, but then Bob could basically in the future deny any traffic to Charlie. So um, that's, that's of course something, I mean it's kind of this, it goes into the direction of the verifier's dilemma, but we basically see with incentives you can, you can improve that because Charlie simply won't get any payment for succeeding uh, transaction that she denies Bob. So it continues in the same fashion. Charlie takes the packet. With the help of Dave, she will then um, get her payment out. And with that, we basically have the cycle completed. So this is, in simple terms, how our message layer works like. And now let's look at the payment layer. So on a payment layer, what we see is that uh, we see these kind of um, encrypted payments going around and we have two key halves. So it's a secret sharing mechanism which we have in place there. Um, and Bob can, to, to obtain his payment, Bob can derive the first key half and the second one he needs Charlie's help for. And with that he can uh, get his payment and uh, Charlie gets, gets her payment. Um, now, if we look at traditional payment channel um, implementations, we see a couple of limitations here that we are trying to improve upon. The first one is, of course, that we want kind of a tight coupling of the packet and the payment data. And the second one is kind of a proof of relay, right? So we only want you to be able to extract a payment if the next downstream node has actually come, sent you a confirmation. What we also want is we want you, I mean, in a realistic scenario, there is packet loss, right? Things don't always go well. So we need to be able to um, have partial payouts. And with traditional payment channel implementations, um, you see that payment channels are always set to absolute values, right? We don't just have delta amounts. We, we set a payment channel to an absolute value. So if I send you a transaction, or if I send you a million transactions, and you were only ever successfully relaying the last one of them, you would still get the full payment because it sets it to the absolute value of the last transaction. So that's one problem. And the second one is you could say, well, we kind of unlock a payment on a, on a packet by packet basis, but that would be kind of a huge proof size which you would deliver to the, to the blockchain. Um, and then what could be said is because we heard quite some things about snarks and starts and, and fancy crypto stuff, so the goal of Hopper is that this ideally runs on IoT devices, on really small devices that are somewhere out there in the field and which do not have the capabilities of um, doing really complex computations on there. That's why we try to go for relatively simple crypto here. So this is a bit more in detail how this proof of relay works and to understand it I will walk you once through a settling of a, of a payment channel. <coughs> So our players are on the left, is of course a smart contract, that's our payment channel smart contracts. It's uh, Alice, Bob and Charlie. And this interaction here is Bob uh, closing his, um, his payment channel. So basically getting his money out that he got one way or another from Alice. So first of all, a, the smart contract is validating a signature over a curve point that uh, Bob gets from Alice, that's the best token. Um, the smart contract is then also validating a pre-image of this point. So basically, we have this um, we have this publicly known curve point, kind of a um, pre-image here. So this multiplication is an elliptic curve operation, so you cannot easily invert it. And it could also be, as I mentioned before, that partial payout should be possible. So it could be that some secrets will not be like Bob will not be able to derive all pre-images. So there's some parts of that uh, which is which is uh, which just failed. Now, basically, we need to walk through where do we get all these values from and what do they mean, right? So Alice sends kind of an updated curve point with every single packet, and she signs it. This is an analogy to um, to the updated values of um, of traditional payment channel implementations. Okay, so we have the S total. From the difference between two succeeding S totals, we kind of have the delta S from which we could also assemble the S fail if something goes wrong. I got a package from Alice, but I can't um, pass it on to Charlie, so I basically add that to my, to my S fail. 
Um, now for the for the parts where, where things did go wrong, uh, did go right. So for successfully relayed packets, Bob can derive um, a first key half and a second key half, which he needs the collaboration from a downstream node. So the first key half he gets himself, whereas the second key half gets delivered from the next downstream node. Right. So basically, you just sum that all up. And that gives you the pre-image um, of the uh, so so-called like you could say the secret which you deliver to the smart contract uh, for for payout, right? So because this one here still gets gets multiplied, it's it's basically a secret that was known by Alice gets gets transmitted in a different form over the wire, and then can be used by you and only you in order to unlock your payment. So this is basically how we achieve a payout conditional to the, um, to the delivery of a packet evidenced by having a key half from a downstream node and having an efficient settlement that is basically um, yeah, that, it, that is basically constant in, in um, effort and data's overhead. So we can settle that on Ethereum uh, today. Cool. And um, yeah, with that I think we're running a bit out of time. My connection here is pretty poor, so um, I let you I let you check out our. Yeah, okay, I expected that. Um, sorry for that. So we have a, we have a smart contract on here. You see some transactions of um, opening and closing payment channels and receiving a payout. Maybe you have better connections uh, than I do, so you can check that out. And with that, I'm open for our questions. Thank you very much. Yes. So that, does the um, settlement of the payment not kind of uh, like introduce like leak who sent what to whom? Yeah, that's of course a good question, right? Um, yes, of course it does leak something, but um, it leaks kind of minimal information about what payment channels you have. And kind of what you used in bulk. So you would, if you would do something super stupid, like you would settle on a packet by packet basis, which is not even economical, then yeah, that would be pretty bad. But what I imagine more is that you would do that on a monthly or quarterly basis. Okay. So you would then say, okay, every month I want to take my money out, and basically what we would see is that you got X out of this, right? So you would see here you would get I don't know 0 0.5 ETH out of it. So yes, it leaks some information, but not more than is publicly known anyway. And um, yeah, what we're working on right now is how do we incentivize people to open as many, like reasonably many payment channels, useful payment channels, to reduce the meaningfulness of this information. Okay. Uh, thank you for the talk. And I actually have a bunch of questions. So first one is that I know the mixed networks actually uh, suffer from high latency. So how is the hopper solve the problem? And second one is that recently I know the protocol called CMIX, it's uh, using uh, mixing as well. So I wonder if you guys uh, had a study on that and what's your opinion on that? How do you compare this ball? And NL there's a proposal on Ethereum is to use Onion routing to, um, to, to prevent from censoring from the full node. So is there any possible that you can use hopper protocol to try to uh, deal with the problem? And what's your opinion? Thank you. Cool. Let me try to remember all these. So yes, um, basically this sort of this sort of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, communication is certainly slower than direct communication. That's clear. The question is how bad, right? And the question was how bad we want to keep uh, customizable by the application layer. So if you build a chat app like a WeChat 2.0, you want some one-second latency. You have like kind of okay privacy. So there's this fundamental um, trade-off between privacy and latency. Um, if you want to do kind of um, like, I don't know, some, some um, activist group emails, then probably you want hardcore privacy and you need like 30 minute latencies. So it, it should be possible to define that um, on application layer. Um, your second question on CMIX, we will need to look in the implementation details. Like there's a lot of ideas right now out there and not all are really implemented, so it's kind of hard to tell. This is, by the way, it's all open source. You yeah. can check it out on our GitHub, feel free. And the third the question... The one is, uh, 
Ethereum, there's a proposal ah, for you. Yes, around. so um, right now Ethereum doesn't, unlike um, Bitcoin, Ethereum does not uh, support only routing out of the box. Um, yeah, that was one of the inspirations why we started to offer as well. Absolutely. Really? So uh, so do you think that this is going to like enhance Ethereum in the future, probably? That's the goal. I mean, for us, that's the goal. Uh, admittedly, we're pretty early on here, right? So uh, we're looking at a, a largely unfunded project except for some donations. So um, yeah, but that's absolutely the goal. Well, thank you. Any more questions yeah. for you? Do you have to open up a payment channel with every um, neighbor that you have, or I guess with every relay? Like, how do you, how does that work? And also, isn't there a churn in terms of like new relays popping up and other ones going away? Do I have to constantly be opening up new payment channels? Is that happening under the hood? Yeah, so how does this work right now? Right now we have a slightly optimistic uh, scenario where we open them on demand for you, which is quite easy to exploit, right? Um, but the idea is that you have some strategies as to what payment channels you want to open. So we would actively, uh, you would actively open them, and we would have some default strategy that you could, you could change yourself. Because it is right, you will have some churn, um, but also some nodes will be decent relayers and others would not be. So basically to reduce churn, um, we are currently working on some mechanism of uh, slashing. Um, those relayers that are offline for a too long amount of time. <laughs> so basically something that would be annoying is if you're in the London Underground and you're like offline, online, offline, online, so you have like some maximum traffic loss, right? So that's what we want to prevent here. I think we have time for one very last question. Or otherwise, we just close it here and I'm around afterwards if anybody has questions in a one-to-one -one basis. Thank you very much for your attention.